Hello, everyone. My name is David. I'm from Scotland. Uh, I organize a whole bunch of user groups in Glasgow, and I do a lot in the kind of Docker community to help people get kick-started. Um, I don't do a lot of PHP, and I've never built a lot of real applications, so I'm sorry. But fortunately, a lot of the constructs with Docker and a lot of the patterns that we're going to look at today do apply to pretty much every programming language. So first, a small journey. I'm going to be completely honest with you and say this is what my development environment looked like in the year 2000. Now, hopefully not everyone's too young, and a few of you have seen us before, and I won't ask you to show your hands, but we all know who we are. And I'm going to be really, really honest with you, this was actually a production as well. Like, <laughs> nine times out of 10, when you had to roll out a hotfix, you just went on a prod and you made some changes. It, it was a different world back then. But things did eventually get better, and around 2005, 2006, um, Puppet introduced Puppet to the world. And then we got Chef a few years later. So this kind of created this idea that we could have parity between what we actually have in our development environments with what we actually launch to production. So you actually get to eradicate a whole class of problems by having this concept of parity. So that's great. We all want this parity. And I'm going to assume in part that's why a lot of you are in this room. The unfortunate side was these tools were very Ruby-centric, and they had DSLs that either looked like Ruby or just expanded Ruby to a level that was really unfamiliar to like any C derivative-based language programmers. So they weren't great to get started with, and they were quite difficult to use. Then, I think it was around 2009, uh, we got Ansible and we got Vagrant, and this kind of changed things again. Like We now had Ansible, which allowed us to declaratively declare what our environment should look like for YAML, which is fantastic. And we got Vagrant, which actually allowed us to use virtual machines in a really simple fashion for development. Unfortunately, Vagrant's quite slow. Um, it does have to spin up a virtual machine, and that takes time. You then need to get that virtual machine configured through some sort of configuration management tool, which takes time. And then there's no way, really, to take a snapshot or to deploy what you have in your development environment. Yes, we have this idea that the configuration management tools are going to give us some level of parity, but you're not going to be 100% when you get to prod. And it eats a lot of RAM in your machine. Spinning up more than one virtual machine is a very dangerous task. So how long does everyone's Vagrant uptake? Right? I remember when I had a dev team and we were all using Vagrant, things were happy for a while. And then once the developers were using it, we started getting the front end developers to use it. And all the time, maybe four or five times a day, all I'd hear is, hey, Dave, Dave. The Vagrant's not working, and it was the same old crap every time. Oh, Vagrant destroy and Vagrant up. And that's 40 minutes of that developer's life or front-end person's life that we're never getting back. So there has to be a better way. And unfortunately, there is. We've got Docker now, which is virtualization, but without the actual VME aspect of it. So it does run natively on a Linux kernel. Mac and Windows is a slightly different setup, but you know, it's still a lot better than what we were dealing with in the past. So this is from the Docker website. It's the market in mumbo jumbo. But Docker's key thing here is that it does allow us to have that extra layer of parity that we want. We can define our Docker image and then ship it. And we know it's the exact same image. And the reason that is is because all a Docker image is is a snapshot of a file system. That's it. The Docker file is how you get to that file system. But in essence, all you're doing is shipping around a tarball. So we're going to look at a few different components of working with Docker today. First, we want to be able to build an image. All right, that's pretty important. We're going to look at the distribution aspect of that. So how do we get images to and from our machine and into production? And of course, we want to be able to actually run a container as well. And then the majority of this talk, we're going to be looking at orchestration of development environments because you know, our applications aren't just like a main or index.php. We have a lot of dependencies that we have to worry about. So first, image building. This is a Docker file. Right? Hopefully, nobody finds this confusing to read. It's really, really simple. There are only around eight or nine instructions that you're ever going to have to use. And all Docker files start with a from. There has to be a base layer. Now, that's just going to be typically the operating system that you're working with. Or maybe there's an official image for PHP or for Ruby that you want to start with, just to reduce some of the boilerplate that you're going to have to put in your Docker image. Next thing, we have to do a run statement. We want to actually provision this machine in some way. So we don't use any configuration management tools here. 
I say that's a bit of an anti-pattern. I do see people that inject playbooks for Ansible or Chef um, recipes into their Docker container and run those tools, and there's just really not a lot of need there. Um, you don't need the repeatability after you've built your image because you can just ship that image. As I said, it's a snapshot. After you've done some provisioning, we're going to then copy. We have to be able to get our code from our CI server or our local machine into the image. And you just say copy. That's it. And then you can specify the name of the file you want to copy or an entire directory. Nice and simple so far. Next, we could just work to our directive. This is what you're going to use. It's called a, like a, a metadata layer. And it's just going to change the directory for any subsequent command that you, that you have in your Docker file. Please don't have a run statement with a CD into a directory, because it's not going to do what you think it does. So always use the work to our directive. And finally, we have these two really annoying things that I hate explaining every single time. Dockerfile has this concept of an entry point and a command. And it's really confusing. Everybody that I speak to that's just learning Docker doesn't understand what these two things are, how they work together. So I have gave myself a mission to explain it to you in under 20 seconds. So try and keep up. If there is a command in your Docker file and you do a Docker run, it will execute that command. If there is a command on the command line as well as in the Docker file, it will execute the command from the command line. If there is an entry point and a command inside of the Docker file and you do a Docker run, the entry point is the command and the command is the parameter to the entry point. Unless there is an entry point on the command line and a command, in which case it's going to use everything from the command line and disregard everything in the Docker file. And finally, if there is an entry point on the command line, but no command, the command in the Docker file disappears. You're welcome. <laughs> So it is really annoying to explain. What I would suggest is just always assume that an entry point is a command that is enforced to some level, and it's very explicit to override it. The command is actually the option to the entry point, unless it doesn't exist. I know it doesn't really help it still, but you'll get used to it the more Docker files you've wrote together. So that's building. That's it. It's really, really simple. We just have this really simple text file. We have a from. We copy stuff in. We do some provisioning, and we ship it. Done. So image delivery and virtualization, this is actually pulling images and running them. Uh, there's no other way that I can put slides on here to kind of show you how this works, so I'm just going to have a demo. So thumbs up from anyone at the back. Can you read that? Yep. You're not at the back. <laughs> OK. We're going to run. In fact, first, everyone's familiar with Figlet? Nobody? Oh, OK, well, you're going to learn something today as well, besides Docker. Uh, figlet's this really terrible command, but so much fun, and that you just like, say figlet hello, and it prints it out in ASCII art. That's it. Um, and obviously, I don't have it installed. When I run it, it says, hey, there's no command, Dave. Don't do that. So we're going to use Docker. Uh, and I'm going to have to put figlet twice, but that's because I'm using an image called figlet, and then I want to run the command called figlet. And I wasn't smart enough to set up a command. But, you know. Hello, Laracon, hey you. Ta da! So that's a Docker image being run as a container with a command I don't have locally, but is available in that container. So let's actually look at what a Docker container is in a little bit more detail. OK, so I'm saying Docker container run. The dash dash rm just means I want it to clean up when I exit. You don't need to worry about that for the time being. The dash it says interactive. I want to get inside of this container, and I want to poke around and do some stuff. And I'm going to run Ubuntu 18.04. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Ubuntu, but it has a concept of apt and apt-get. This is an Arch install, so I don't have those commands either. But when I hit return, I'm now inside of a container. So you'll see that I'm now root when I previously wasn't root. And the host name in this machine is an arbitrary string that has been identified, or set as an identifier for the container. And I had the apt command. So I'm now, for all essential purposes, using Ubuntu. Now, when we talk about the isolation or containment aspects of Docker, we're really talking about maybe three different things. First, network virtualization. This machine has to, well, this container 
has two different um, IP addresses. It has the 127001, of course, and then it has a 172 dot. And again, if I run this locally, I actually have many more devices. So we're actually restricting the scope of what the container can see network-wise. It only has the network devices we allow it to see. So that's quite interesting. What about the file system? Now, that looks quite normal. And again, if I do this here, you'd probably struggle to see any major differences right now. But if I do an ls on slash home, you'll see my username, my directory. That's my account. If I do this here, there's nothing. So the file system that is giving to the container is completely different from the file system that I have locally. Again, we're limiting the scope of what it has access to. And there's a demo that I always tell myself I'm never going to do again, and that's blow away the entire root file system, which if I do in my host machine, this talk is over and we're all going to watch the keynote. But because I'm in a container, hopefully, <laughs> I can get away with this. Now, I know the sysadmins or the Linux people around you are going, no, nah, he's, he's lying because he's not got no preserved root. Well, you're right. I'm nervous. Right, so we have no LS. That's not a good start. There's no who. There's no PS. This is a completely broken Linux distribution. But... I can drop out, spin up a new one, and we're back to normal. So containers are awesome, because you imagine this is your code in production, and it's in an environment like that where they can't see the networking stack of the host. They can't pollute or destroy your local file system. And even the process ID table is hidden. So they don't know what else is running on your host. Now, everybody wants this, right? Yes, Dave. So we kind of looked at that. Oh, no, we didn't. We didn't pull an image. So if I do Docker image LS, you'll see that I have a whole bunch of images. There are official images for so much software that you don't even have to build these yourself. Just quickly on the screen, you're going to see Elasticsearch, you're going to see Redis, you're going to see Mongo, Python, all these different things that are just available to you, and you can use these images. And to pull a new one, you just do Dockage image pull, CentOS 7, and now I can jump straight into a CentOS container immediately. That's pretty cool. And that's the same way that when you have your CI server build your image from your Docker file, your production host is just doing this pull. And because it's a tar snapshot, the parity is guaranteed because it's the exact same file system. Now, the chunkier subject, Docker Compose. Now, our applications aren't really simple applications. Right? We're all building very complicated things these days, or at least sometimes we make them more complicated than they have to be. But we have all of these dependencies that we need to worry about. Right? I'm going to assume most people here have Node in their apps, because I'm pretty sure Laravel ships with Webpack or Brunch or something like that for compiling static assets in JavaScript. So Node's a given. Uh, because it's PHP, you probably need Varnish or some sort of caching. Uh, caching. And there's always a database. Our applications have state whether you're using RuaDB or MySQL or Postgres. These are still things that you need, either on this holy Trinity dev server that you keep in your office that everyone uses, or you have to install on your own machine, and that becomes very cumbersome. So besides Docker itself, the Docker company have released this tool. It's open source. It's called Docker Compose. It allows us to compose environments with all of these different dependencies. So what I'm going to touch on here are the four, stops to Docker, yeah, four steps to Docker adoption. Uh, one of them I'm not going to cover, because it was covered by Alex earlier. So if you haven't seen the 12-factor manifesto and his talk, you can catch it on YouTube, I'm sure, when these talks go online. Uh, I'm going to focus on satisfying those dependencies of the external applications that we need, bring in Docker into our CI process to build the image, and then something that I've been promoting for the last couple of years is this concept of the Docker shell pattern, which is just promoting native workflows using Docker and you will see that in action. So first, let's satisfy some dependencies. Docker Compose uses YAML. We're all very familiar at writing YAML, so this should hopefully look nice and simple to you. Uh, here, I'm specifying that I need a database service, and I'm going to use the MariaDB 10 image, and I can configure that with some environment variables. So I'm just setting a user and a password and a database that I want to be created 
when I use this image. At the top of the Docker Compose file, we do need to specify a version. There is a version 3. I would suggest that you avoid it and stick to 2.4. The reason is, is that Docker kind of pivoted, and they started using the Docker Compose file to deploy to production, uh, and I'm not a fan of that. And they took away loads of really cool dev features like health checks, which we're going to touch on in a minute as well. So stick to 2.4 if you want to see some of the, or use some of the things that I'm about to show you. And people always say it's a downgrade. Why should I downgrade? It's not. Uh, three was aimed at targeting production, whereas two was more aimed at developers. So I'm going to have a PHP service, which is going to use PHP 7. It's a web app, so I'm going to expose port 80 from the container to port 80 on my host. And I want to mount in my code. So that's all the volume line is saying here. Dot, current directory, colon, and then I'm going to mount it into slash code. Now, there is this uh, kind of colon cached on the end. Um, if you're a Mac user or on Windows and you've been using Docker Compose already, you may be having some latency issues when you try and browse to your application, maybe upwards of 10 seconds or 30 seconds in like, the, the craziest cases. And the way to get around that is to use this, this kind of cache thing on the end, which just says, I don't mind if they're slightly out of sync as long as it eventually gets into the container. And it's just because you have so many files there, particularly that vendor directory, it can end up tens or tens of thousands of files. And then tempfs is really, really important as well. Things that you don't need out of the container, you should stick into tempfs. So you're caching your logs. There's no point in using all of that disk I.O. to pull them back down to your host disk. So just make sure they live in RAM. And when you kill that container, they just disappear. You generally don't need them anyway. Then I add my database back in, and then just live side by side under that services definition. And that's it. Really, really simple. But when I spin up my PHP application, I need MySQL to be healthy. Maybe I've got some migrations that have to run. So I can add health checks. Uh, so this example is just a health check on my PHP service, which says whenever Netcat can see that port 80 is open, I consider this container healthy. You can do the exact same for the database one and just say nc-z3306, which means MySQL is accepting connections on that port. And then you can add a depends on and say that I need my database to be of condition service healthy. And this is what they removed with 3.x version. So this is why you should stick with 2.4. It just makes everything a lot cleaner. And you can usually get your environment up and running with one or two commands. Introduction to Docker for CI. Uh, I want to touch on multi-stage builds, talking about your build cache, uh, and be wary of helper scripts. Now, there's a demo where I'm going to touch on this. Again, seeing it in slides isn't really going to help you in any way, so we're going to keep that for the demo. And finally, the Docker shell. Please don't use ignore platform Rex when you're doing your composer install because you don't have the dependencies on your host. You know, you want that little bit of, of a safety net that when you run this in the container, if you are missing something, you should be aware of it. Um, and that just means you have to tweak the Docker file to make sure you have that extension. And we want you all to be working natively, but inside a container. So all the commands you already do on your, your terminal, you know, your cache clears, or your serves, or your compiling of assets, those should still all work just the way that they work just now. And the perks bit, we still want your IDE auto-completion to work. Right, a lot of the container workflows that I've seen, once you run everything inside of a container, you're not normally pulling enough back out to actually get the autocomplete for PHP Storm or Code or Atom or anything like that to give you a really good autocomplete solution. So let's jump back into my terminal. Okay, so this is an October CMS project, which is based on Laravel. Um, as you can see, I have made a couple of tweaks. So we're just going to take a look at them first. So first, <laughs> I modified the editor config because make files crash when they don't have tabs. Yeah, so we can probably ignore that. I did make a change to the MySQL configuration because we want to be 12 factor. We want to make sure that we're injecting our database username and password and host and all that when we launch, uh, launch our container, rather than hard coding that into the config file. So. What else have we got? So let's take a look at this Docker file. So firstly, we've got the from statement. I'm using the official 
PHP 7 Apache image. Um, and I've got an as tag on the end. Whenever you see that, it's a really good indicator that there's going to be a multi-stage build, which means I'm going to have more than one from statement. Uh, why that is really cool will become a little bit apparent just as we move through the file. So on my base layer, I'm setting the working directory to slash code. That's where all of the compilation and all the asset building is going to happen. Oh, get rid of that. And then we just move on to the next layer. So now I want to compile some extensions. October CMS does need a database, and the official PHP image does not include PDO and PDO MySQL. So we actually need to provide them. So these are the commands that are going to do that. First, I need to update the app cache, because the container shipped without one. And then you have to install the Zlib developer dependencies, because that's needed for the zip extension, which we need for Composer to be able to unzip things. And we need PDO MySQL. And there's a helper script here, and I said to be wary of that. And that's because it installs a lot of the dependencies required for these extensions to be compiled and aren't necessarily cleaned up afterwards. So you'll see the comment here says, this layer, just doing these two commands to get these two extensions is over 60 megs added to my image. When the 2.so files are only 300k. And you can imagine the more extensions you have and the more things going on here, that that 60 meg could very quickly turn into hundreds of megs. And that's just going to be on every pool that you do in a server. So you can imagine that grows pretty, pretty quickly. Then we jump down to another layer. The base PHP project doesn't ship with Composer. The official PHP images don't ship with Composer. Um, so I just set up a layer that's going to have Composer. I set the Composer home because it needs somewhere to store its cache. And because this is an Ubuntu image, I just need to tell apt that we're, we're not interactive, right? So there's no front end. It's not going to ask me any questions. Uh, and I then copy from the previous layer. So the previous one installed those extensions, has those .sos on it. They don't exist in my new layer. So I just say copy from the extensions layer, and I pull those two, two files in. So PDO, libz, oh, sorry, three, and then there's the zip extension as well. So you can use the copy statement with a dash dash from to pull files from any other layer. What's also cool is I can pull files from images that aren't in any other layer. So this is the official Composer image with a tag of 172. And although it's not mentioned previously, I can still pull things from it. And the Docker daemon in the background is going to pull that image and grab that file and stick it into this layer for me. So now I have my base layer with the .so files and Composer available, which is great. OK, a couple more things. Now we want to be able to install our dependencies. We want to be able to run Composer install. Now, we're not going to do that in our dev mode. This is now entering what we would do in CI. We want our CI pipeline to be one command, docker image build. That's all. So we use the composer as a base, and we copy in the composer.json. That's it. The reason that we do that is because whenever you do a copy, there is the potential for it to bust your cache. If we copy the entire source directory in and any file has changed, we have to repeat all of the steps that come after it. Our composer.json files probably don't change as frequently as all of the code. So by just copying the composer.json, if that file hasn't changed, we don't need to run the composer install. It's going to use the cache, and it's going to move right by it. This is how you're going to get your CI from being 30 or 40 minutes down to three, three minutes or four minutes or something around that ballpark. So I have another layer for CI, which is doing a Composer install. This is just with, with the dev dependencies, um, because I now need to add them on so that I can run my unit test as part of my build process. So we do a Composer install again, which will just fetch those last little bits. Uh, only we never then carry those um, PHP unit and other dev dependencies forward to the next layer, so they just get blown away afterwards. We then run our unit tests using the CI as the base, because it has the dev dependencies, and we run our integration tests. Now, the reason that you want to put these into multiple from statements is because there's this new tool from Docker called BuildKit, which is replacing the build, uh, the build process for the Docker command line, which is actually going to process your Docker file as a graph. And if it understands that there's no dependencies, it's actually going to build the different layers in parallel. Again, you're going to get a lot of speed benefits here by making sure that you've got your unit test and your integration test 
run it in different from statements. Now we get down to production. So we're ignoring that CI base that we added the dev dependencies in. We're going back to the depths one. We're giving it the name production. And we're just going to copy in all of the code now. And we're going to copy in an Apache virtual host. And our entry point is going to be set to Apache 2. And that's it. We build this, and we can run that image, and our code is going to magically work. Now, there's a couple more files here. We have the make file and the Docker compose. The make file has a couple of quirks in it. So the way that I like to build my make files is that I have two different sections. First, anything that's kind of prefixed with a D is a Docker command, which means I want to make a Docker development environment or tear down a Docker development environment. So here I've got D shell, which is Docker shell. And it's going to do a Docker Compose run. I'm going to specify the user, because I don't want any quirky file permission issues when I write things in a container that I can't read locally. Again, that's going to break your autocomplete. We're going to publish the service ports, because of our application as a web app, we're going to need access to port 80 or port 8080. And we're going to set the entry point to bash rather than being Apache. And that's because we want to get interactive. We want to be able to work natively, but inside of a container. And this will make a lot more sense when I actually do it. Then I normally have another part of the make file, and this is just the standard targets. Now, you don't need to put them in a make file if you don't want. If you want to use composer.json scripts, feel free. Whatever you use, whatever you use as your kind of task runner, just continue to use it. For me, it's make. And here, I just want to make up. And that's just going to run ours and serve. Uh, we have to set the dash dash host to 0.0.0.0 .0 because we're in a container, and we need to listen on all the interfaces so that we can actually browse to it locally. And there is one condition. If you copy this and you do have a, a, an up target, you have to sing it in the style of System of a Down's Chop Suey when you go, make up. It's a rule, right? I've not made it up. You just have to follow it. And if you don't know what that song is, you have to listen to it too. Right, now the Docker Compose file. As you'll see, I'm using version 2.4. I have PHP. I have the image tag, and I have a build. So I'm not just relying on an image. I'm actually going to build my own. And I just put this image here to give it a name. And there's a quirky reason for that. You don't need it. But you'll see why I have it in just a second. We're passing in the build context, and that's the dot, the current directory with all of my code. What actually happens when you do an image build is that Docker will tar up the entire context directory and send it to the daemon. Most of the time, it's local, but you could actually send it to a remote Docker daemon, and the build could happen on another machine. But dots, pretty much, nine times out of 10 are going to be what you want here. Then we have a target. So for development, I don't need to build all the way to production. I don't need to build all the way to CI and have all my tests running. I just need enough that I can work natively. And we're going to target the composer layer because we want composer. We want to be able to type composer install. Now, we're going to use env file because I want to inject all of my environment and 12-factor configuration into the container so that my app works. I set the working directory slash code. That is in my Docker file, so I don't necessarily need it. But you can set it here as well. And actually, the only reason I included it here was just to have a bit of a moan at Docker because it's worked during the Docker file, but working during the compose and it always annoys me. So. We can then add some extra environment if we need that's not in a .env file. I, I generally leave the MySQL host separately. The reason I don't put it in a .env is because some people might not work with Docker. You may choose to, but some other people in your team just may not want to. Uh, the host is whatever you call the service. So you'll see here my database service that's called MariaDB, and that's going to be my MySQL host. And I prefer them two entries to be as close to each other as possible, which is why I keep the host as a specific environment setter. I then have the tempfs, because I don't want any temporary files or logging to use up my disk I.O. I expose the port, and then I've just got a couple of dependencies. So I'm just saying, don't start my PHP container until I have MariaDB as healthy and Elasticsearch as started. Elasticsearch doesn't have to be healthy, but I just want it to start in the background while my PHP thing is doing its thing. And you can see my health checks are really simple. I'm just checking the port is open. If you know MySQL and MariaDB a lot better than I do, then there's a nicer way of doing this. By all means, add your own health checks. So what does this actually look like? Well, first, I can do a Docker Compose. I've just got an alias as DC. If that won't work in your machine, you need to set it up yourself. DC build, and it's going to build my image. 
maybe. Okay. Now, let that kind of go. I actually thought it was using the cache, but I must have changed something. So let's see what happens if we just get rid of it and try and make D-shell. OK, so I do have an image in the cache, but I must have broke it by changing something. So that DC build, we've just ran in the background and built the image. In fact, I think we've got enough time to leave that going. So let's actually just do that. And then I'll show you how the cache can be used at subsequent layers. So now I'm inside of a terminal. And you can see, just like my prompt changed earlier when I was inside of a container, it just says bash. I've lost my nice shiny prompt that I have. And if I do an LS, I'm inside the directory with all the code. And I can run a composer install. Did I target the wrong layer? Let's try user. Then, oh, you liar. OK, so that's built now anyway. So let's just jump back out and back in and hope for the best. So now I have done this already, so the composer install was really quick. I wasn't going to sit and let you watch that, but instead I just thought I'd let you watch the Docker build. But the composer install worked, which is great. Now I can use my artisan serve. Same way you would locally, and hopefully. We have October CMS running. Now, that's inside of a container, but I can still browse to a local host because I've exposed those ports. So let's say I shut that down, I jump back out, and I just want to look at this build cache quickly. Oh, it did use the cache all the way down. Kind of. <laughs> so when we talk about the build cache, we're talking about modifying this Docker file. So the higher up in this file you make a change, the higher the percentage is that you're going to ruin all of the cache and everything else is going to have to build again. So let's, at the very bottom, just set env, hello, true. And I'm going to do a build again. Cache, 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 super quick. No, I don't. Where's that layer? Am I in the right directory? Lara <laughs> uh, yep. Oh, <laughs> I'm so silly. Uh, my Docker file is targeting a certain layer, and I put this afterwards. So I blame you for not telling me. And what we're going to do is our Docker compose file has target composer, and I added it after a composer, so it would never actually be called. So what I'm going to do here is add hello true. Now when we do the Docker Compose build again, at the end we should hopefully see that new instruction. Excellent. Hello true. And it ran in this container with this ID. There was no cache, as you can see with the other layers. But if I take this and move it up here, we're going to invalidate all of that cache, and all of those copy statements will have to run again. And that's what I mean by busting your cache. Just make sure that you're really thinking about where you're making changes in your Docker file. You don't want to invalidate your cache and add loads and loads of time onto a process that should be milliseconds rather than seconds or even worst case minutes. And as you can see, it's doing loads now, and that's going to run away. But that's it. That's all you need to do to take a Laravel project and get it running in Docker Compose. So we just take a look at those changes again. I added a Docker file, and I'll publish this online so people can have a look at it. I added a make file purely just to save myself some keystrokes. I don't want to keep typing the same thing over and over and over again. And then the docker compose.yaml is where the secret sauce lives. You're just saying, I need these other services. I need these ones to be healthy. And then you can spin up this one. And if you want, you can just use an interactive container so you can work as natively as you do now. And then it should be fun, hopefully. So let's jump back over to the slides. Nope, 
dev tools. We don't need that. So image building, running, pull and push in, orchestration. Now I'm going to give you some tips just to make your experience a little bit easier. So firstly, um, I have a plugin on GitHub. If you use Zshell, you can install this. And it's going to give you loads of really cool things that you can do natively locally. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so you can see the PHP goes green here. I still don't actually have PHP installed. So if I do which, you'll actually see it's an alias that calls a function from my plugin and says, I want to run PHP, I want to run 7CLI, I'm going to run the PHP command, and whatever parameters come after it, pass it in. But what makes this plugin really cool is if I do PHP artist and serve locally on my host, it detects that there's a composer.yaml and it has a PHP service defined inside of it and actually runs the Docker Compose YAML for me. So if I refresh, I still have October CMS. It's a really cool plugin. It's going to give you that little bit of local working if you wish to work that way without having to do the DShell part. Uh, and if that Docker Compose file wasn't there, so if I jump into a directory where there is no Docker Compose and I run php dash dash version, it's actually just going to spin up a container, exit the version, and nothing happens with Docker Compose. So hopefully you find that quite useful. I, I enjoy using that plugin quite a lot. OK. Don't bust your cache. Be really careful about when you're modifying your Docker file. If you have a package.json for npm, and you have a layer for doing the npm install, only copy in the package.json. If you've got a pip file or a bundle file for Ruby, again, just copy in that one file, pull the dependencies, and then make sure your cache is used every time. Be really careful when you use Docker Compose for more than one project. Every Compose project does create a new network on your machine. Eventually, you're going to get collisions. Um, I used to get mildly annoyed when I couldn't connect to public Wi-Fi spot, hotspots. And it actually turned out that I had so many Docker Compose networks, there was no, I couldn't reach that network because I was actually using it for something else. Uh, so what you should try and do regularly is just do a Docker Compose down, kill all the resources, and then the next time you go back to the project, you can just spin it back up. And if you are using volumes, just do a dash V, otherwise you're going to eat up a lot of disk space very, very quickly as well. Always logs to standard out. The Docker engine has loads of really cool things for taking those logs from standard out and shipping them somewhere. Right? If you're still writing to a file in var log or even just locally to your directory, you then have to bolt on an extra container to get those logs, to get those logs out. By writing to standard out, you don't need to worry about any of that. The Docker engine has you covered. It can ship to log stash and loads of other things. Docker system prune. My new favorite is command. It just cleans up loads of things that you don't need. The more images you pull, you know, you're pulling one or two a day, those add up. Some images are massive, some images are small. Eventually, it eats all your disk. Docker system prune will just work out which ones you aren't using and get rid of them. If you really want, you can actually pass like an AF to it, and it'll just get rid of everything, and it'll be like a really clean slate. It also removes uh, volumes aren't being used and networks aren't being used. So prune, good command. You can use Ubuntu or CentOS. What you'll find is these images can be rather large. Um, and this example is, is maybe a bit more trivial, but the Ubuntu one ranges from 85 to 130 meg, depending on the version you use. There is a, a new operating system built for container runtimes called Alpine. And it manages to get the entire tooling that you need in under 4 meg. And that's just ridiculously small. And there is a PHP variant of this. So you can just target PHP colon Alpine and you get a really small base layer. Right? If you can get away with it, definitely do it. The only time you're going to have some issues is if some of the extensions you have to install into the PHP runtime require glibc rather than muscle c. But I don't think there's anything notable that I've tried to use there at failed. OK, Nginx and FPM, the number one question I get all the time when I speak to people about Docker and PHP. I actually quite like Apache, but people want to run FPM with Nginx serving it. Um, please, please don't build two images with all of your code in it. It's just completely not needed. Put your code into your PHP FPM image, expose it as a volume, so you can just, in your Docker file, just do volume slash code, and then your Nginx can consume that volume. Because Nginx actually needs the files to kind of be there too, so it knows to proxy them onto FPM. So do volumes from PHP, and your Nginx image can just be the official one with the config mounted in. 
you don't need to add your code. Because the problem is your code image is going to be 400 meg probably. And if you do that for Nginx, that's a gig to deploy. So avoid that duplicate. Once you start shipping containers under production, there are three projects you should start to look at. Open Census, Open Metrics, and Open Tracing. I'm assuming that people in this room are starting to look at Docker because they're probably breaking down a monolithic application into microservices. Right, a few strange looking faces are worried about that. Then you're going to need tracing, you're going to need metrics. And there are already libraries that integrate with all of the PHP frameworks based on these three projects. So you should take a look into that as well. And the mandatory requirement for shipping anything into production, dash, dash, read only. Please never ship a PHP container into prod without this flag. When you run, I'm going to assume that everyone here writing PHP is probably working on some sort of web project. And our number one attack surface is people uploading files to our media directory. And then that injecting the script, which modifies your code and serves that to your customers. You can eradicate that entire array of problems by just having a read-only file system and then having one volume for the uploads. So even if they do get that script into your uploads directory, it can't modify your source. So that entire problem place just goes away. So please don't ship anything into production without dash dash read only. I've been told we're not having questions, but if you do want to ask anything, just come up and speak to me. Um, but thank you very much for your time. I hope you've all learned a little bit about Docker, and you can all bend the vagrant files on Monday. Thank you. <laughs>